Hello everybody and welcome again to Online Church from Hope Church here in Newtown, Mid Wales. We're really glad that you've been able to join us today and we do trust that you will enjoy this presentation from our church. If you'd like to join us any Sunday, we meet at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock for two repeat services every Sunday morning and you are really welcome to come and join us. Just go online and book your seat and there'll be a very warm welcome for you. Today we're coming to the final part of our series that we've been doing over the last few weeks since we opened church and we're really blessed and privileged today for our senior leader Denise Kagenvan to bring us that word. We trust and pray it will be a blessing to you and again thanks for joining us. Today is the last in our series of our Now What. The reason we did this series is because we were opening back live in the building and uh, we literally were thinking as a leadership team, now what? And uh, we just thought what we don't want to do is just uh, preach and not connect. We want to help you with your uh, now what moments. Navigating the unexpected is the tagline and And all of us over these last few months have been navigating the unexpected. Uh, I don't know how it's been for you, but I know how it's been for me. And we've all had to navigate unknown circumstances and also are, at this point, navigating unexpected and unknown circumstances. Now, today I want to talk to you about some characters or an account in Scripture that some of you... Um, may know about, but I've got a funny feeling that you don't know a lot about. And uh, you're going to find that in 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. And today I'm going to talk about one of your favorite subjects, and it is relationships. Uh, Because we all are involved with relationships. You know, our lives are built on relationships. You have relationships with your spouse. You have relationships with your siblings, your parents, uh, your colleagues in in school, your children, in work, your children. And and now the question really is, is who knows that relationships are challenging? They are, because not everyone is as mature as you, of course. You know, not everyone is as normal as moi. You know, we, we all think that everyone else is dysfunctional and everyone else is a bit abnormal. Everyone else has got a few issues. But me, but you, it's, we're, we're doing good. But what we thought we'd do, we'd end this series in talking about how we navigate difficult relationships in our world because I guarantee over these last few months, especially when you were in lockdown and you were stuck with that just one family that kept irritating you and you were stuck at home uh, with your children and as much as you love them, you had your moments. So in this account, before we launch in, uh, I want to talk to you about three main characters. But when I say that word characters, I don't mean fictitious. They're characters in a story. They're actual people who were in an account in our history. And when we look at these characters, uh, I just want to introduce the differences. And I reckon this, that throughout my message, you will see yourself in one of these characters. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who you're going to see yourself in, uh, but I guarantee you'll see aspects of yourself in these characters. Now, the first person in this account is a man called Nabal. We'll call him Nabal. If you say it, interpret it right, it's Nabal, but I'll probably dash in and out of Nabal and Nabal. It's the same person. It's not two people. It's just that I've been soaking on this message all week and I keep flitting from either or. And so it is the same person. Now, this character, he was rude. He's impolite. He's hot-headed. He's obnoxious. He liked wisdom and tact. Nice. He's a nice person. And then in this account, there's Abigail. Abigail, believe it or not, she's his wife. And she was a woman of wisdom, intelligence, and beauty. How did that happen? I've no idea. That isn't part of this conversation, and it never will be. However, then the third character in the story is David. Now, David 
is who we know as became King David. And he, at this point, he isn't king. He hasn't become king. He's been anointed as king. But right now, he's a fugitive. He's running away from King Saul, who's jealous and envious of him. And King Saul is out to murder David the fugitive. And he's had so many opportunities to hunt him down and track him down and kill him. But he doesn't seem to get uh, the opportunity. And what we look at is David, he's on this journey as a fugitive, going on into the future, waiting for this day where he will become king. And what I want us to do is see three things in this account that, which will help us to navigate uh, awkward relationships in life. And the first thing I want to look at is the character Nabal. Nabal who ruined a legacy. Verse 1, it says this, A certain man in Moan, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. It's talking about Nabal. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. So it's a sheep shearing time. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was intelligent and beautiful, and her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. And then it says this little line. So you hear all about him. And then it says this little line. He was a Calebite. Hold on to that line. So there's two things immediately we learn about Nabal. Number one, he's rich. And when we look in scripture, the Hebrew for rich was heavy. That means in our language, this guy was loaded. This guy was absolutely minted. And then we learn something else about his character, is that he lived up to his name. In ancient Israel, when it came to people being named, sometimes, obviously, they were named at birth, sometimes they were named later, according to the character, and their name changed. And when it came to a name, it was always connected with a person, person's character. You know the name Nabal? Literally, it's nothing extravagant, but it actually meant fool. Imagine that. I mean, I don't think when he was born, his parents initially went fool. I, don't, I just don't. I mean, it might have. I'm not saying. But I just don't imagine that happened. I, I hope not. And um, so at some point in his life, someone named him Nabal. And he became this fool. Uh, we don't know if Nabal's given this name at birth. He earned it. We're not sure. But what we do know from this account, he lived up to it. Abigail's name, you know what it meant? My father's joy. I mean, can you imagine being called my father's joy? So here you have a husband who is cruel, is harsh, is evil in his dealings, and then this wife who's intelligent and sensible and beautiful. Now, it's interesting to know in this account, Nabal, the fool, is an ancestor to Caleb. Verse 1. He was a Calebite. And, and what I find interesting in Scripture is that it just tagged that on the end. It didn't need to. And if you rush through that, it, it kind of means nothing. But he was an ancestor of Caleb. If you don't know Caleb, I want to introduce you to him. He was a hero of the faith. Caleb, he was filled with faith. Caleb was a mountain taker. He said, give me this mountain. I'm having this mountain. It's mine. Caleb is part of the Caleb and Joshua fame who said out of the spies, we can take the promised land. So when everybody else was saying, it can't be done, we can't succeed, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes, he's going, we're taking the land. This is Caleb. This is an ancestor to Nabal. The Hebrew meaning for Caleb is this. Faithful, wholehearted, bold, brave. And this is what I see in this account that I want everyone to see. That despite this great legacy that Caleb had passed down through his descendants, Nabal, Nabal left his legacy in history. It was left for him. 
He had someone who he could look at and say, he's a mountain taker. He's a mountain mover. He's a promised land obtainer. And this is what I love about scripture. If you don't know much about the Bible yet, and all you've heard ever is that it's just a big book and it's old and it's just boring, it really isn't when you get to know it and love it. At this account, in this one short sentence, he was a Calebite. It reveals to us a life-changing paradigm. This is it. That our lives, your life does not have to be shaped by chance, but by choice. You have the choice. Your life is not directed by your DNA. It's directed by your decisions. That means this. If you have had a negative, dysfunctional upbringing, and that is in your family tree, and you are sat here today thinking, what hope is there for me? I've not had all that they've had. It's been dysfunctional, it's been irritating, it's been hard. You can leave it in your history. You have that choice. Amen to that. You are not just a product of your past. You don't have to live any longer as a product of your past. But you can have faith and change it for faith for your future. But... The same thing matters on the other side. If you have had a positive legacy passed down to you, you know, your, your uh, uh, descendants are uh, mountain-moving people. They're faith people. They're founders in, in the house of God. They're pillars in the house of God. You can still leave that in history too. Don't assume because you look back and you think, you know, my parents were evangelists, my my grandparents were missionaries, and and you can line them all off, that that will essentially automatically be your destiny. Because you've got to choose it. You've got to choose it. They can offer you all that they were and every experience that they had, but unless you choose it, and say, I am going to follow that, I'm going to build on that, then your story for your future won't be that. You know, you can come from a good line and go bad. And you can come from a bad line and go good. And most of us all go, hallelujah for that. Praise God for that. You know what Nabal did? He left his legacy behind. He, He kind of, he was a Calebite. He left all that faith, all that story, all that experience, all the boldness, all the devotion to God. And and he left his legacy behind and he chose to live up to a label that either his parents put on him or someone put on him or possibly he put on him. We don't know. But he decided, you know what? I'm going to throw all that history away, all that incredible history. I'm not going to have all that. I'm going to be a fool. I'm going to live my life as a fool. I mean, who would do that? But actually, he glories in it. You know, at school, I hated maths, and anyone who's close to me knows I still hate maths. And um, I I just hated maths, but I can see the pattern uh, going back why I hated maths. Now, number one, I'd say I'm not a natural, so I own that. But number two, in primary school, uh, because I, I, were, I could not do my times table, and no matter how many times I did it, I could not seem to grasp it and it stick. So the teacher in the 70s, just saying it out there for all you good teachers, I'm not saying this about you, but in the 70s, she knew I really struggled, so she'd stand me up in every math class and tell me to do my times table and go through as many as I could until I looked an absolute fool. I remember it vividly now. That's how much it scarred me. So I would stand up in the class and I'd start saying it and I'd get so embarrassed and then the teacher would mock me and then the class would laugh at me and and that's how it went. All through my primary school, junior school. You know what happened is that when I went to high school, I started living up to the label because the label on me was thick at maths. So I thought, you know, it's not worth trying. So I lived up to that label. And in high school, I hated maths. 
and I made sure the teacher knew I hated maths. What happened was, uh, in, in even the last few weeks, I've been looking at report cards at my mum and dad's house, and I was looking at every time it came to maths, it would always say she could do better, or she could concentrate, or she's a nightmare. It, went, it was so obvious that I hated maths. And I chose to live up to the label that was put upon me. I could have been better. You know, I was so bad in maths is that when the teacher was moving on and someone else was coming in their place, I said, great, good riddance. And uh, he said to me, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. That's the first time I ever heard that. And I just sat there going, oh, really? Oh, really? Uh, that's how bad it was. But I, I chose to live up to that label. You know what? I believe I could be good at maths. I'm not fussed about being good at maths now, but I believe I could because in those times, I chose not to. I chose to live up to the label that was put on me. And I want us to ask ourselves the question, what label are you living up to today that you've put on you or others have put on you or someone, a parent has put on you and you just feel that's all you're worth. And you're living up to the label of idiot, fool, worthless. Think about Abigail. Although she lived with a fool, she never became a fool. Don't ask me, but that is an incredible thing. She lived with a rude, obnoxious man, and she didn't become any of those things. But this is the only explanation. She chose not to. She chose not to. She was devoted to God. She chose not to. And you might say to me, oh, Denise, it isn't that simple. And I have sympathy with that. But it isn't simple. I'm not saying it's simple. What I am saying, it's doable. It's doable. God is stronger in you. God is greater in you. God has a better destiny than you believe you've got. I want to speak life to some of you. I want to prophesy destiny to some of you who have been stuck in a rut because of the labels that have been placed on your life over the last few years. And you've started to buckle to them. You know, we live in a society that doesn't like to take responsibility. You know, it's always someone else's fault. It's always someone else's fault that we're dysfunctional. It's always someone else's fault that we're negative. Oh, it's because this happened in my past. And it's because of what this person said. And this is what this person did. And they're all real. I'm not saying that it's not real. I know the effects of negativity. I know the effects of these things. It shapes us. It, it, it gains, causes our behavior to blend into the atmosphere that we've been brought up in with the words and the actions and the attitudes. It does. It just does. But I'm just convinced in Christ, in God, we can become who he says we are. I'm convinced. And so I want to say to you today, church, don't be a victim of your environment. Be a creator of the environment. Right now, the media are creating an environment of fear. I'm going to speak faith over that fear. I'm going to create the leadership team in this house are creating an environment of faith over fear. You know, it's great that we're informed. You know, we don't want to be fools in times like this. We need to be informed. We need to abide by government guidelines. I'm not saying any different than that. What I'm saying is, it's not to meant to put people in places of fear, intimidation. God made us so we could be free, so we could create environments all around us where people find life, not get bound. So people be part of speaking life into the death at the moment that we see all around us. And I want to say to you, do not become a victim of your environment. You know, your family tree doesn't choose your destiny. Why did you ever agree with that? I mean, your friends don't dictate your future. Why have you ever consented to that? If you've got people in your world who are, are telling you your future isn't going to be that hot, walk away. You have, you have the power. Since when did you give that power away? Don't let the navels of your life dictate the direction of your life. The second thing I want to look at is David. 
David, he risked his legacy. Verse 4, it says, while David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Now, that seems really simple, but this is the background to that. He heard that Nabal was shearing the sheep. That meant that David's men had been looking after Nabal's sheep for the duration of the year. He'd been protecting Nabal's workers. And so he thought it would be sheep shearing time. So that's where the money's going to be coming in. And uh, my men, David thought, can have some of the money because they've been working hard. It's just an itemized bill. So what he did, he sent 10 of his men to go to Nabal and say, hey, can we have our wages? Now, the scripture makes it really clear that he went to the men and, and they were really warm. They were like, God bless you. May God grant you favor. So they went with soft hearts, not confrontational. And then what we see here is Nabal's obnoxious response. Verse 10 to 11, Nabal says this, who is David? Well, it's just crazy because everyone knew who David was. He, he was like a hero in the land. Everyone knew his fame. And he's saying, who is David? And then he says, who's the son of Jesse? I mean, they all knew who he was. And then he goes on to insult David all the more. There are many servants nowadays who break away from one of their masters. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? Now, I want us to just lean in on, here, on this because I want to help us with our relationships. At Nabal's response to this question, it created a reaction in David. And you're all sat there thinking, yeah, I can understand that. But there's something more concerning in this account than that. It created this reaction that didn't seem natural. Verse 13, David said, put on your sword, men as he's strapping on his, the Bible said. And he took out 400 men, soldiers, strapped with swords to go and kill Nabal. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that a bit odd. Because what we know about him at this point, what we know about David is he's a fugitive and he's on the run from King Saul. And King Saul is trying to kill him. So King Saul is trying to kill him. And David has had the opportunity to kill King Saul, but he refrains from doing it because he wants to honor God. But then a fool steps into his life and just says, ah, who's David, son of Jesse? Who cares about people like him? Don't really matter. And he gets really mad and has this moment of, of temporary insanity. And he wants to go and slaughter the whole lot. He said, I, by, by daybreak, they're all going to be dead. And I, when I read scripture, and this is why we should love scripture, is that when we look into that, we, we lean in and we go, what happened there? Yeah. Hang on a minute. The king is trying to kill you, David. And you're as cool as a cucumber. You're like, yeah, God will vindicate. And a fool speaks up and says, Tosh, like playground. And he's like, I'm going to kill him. And he's strapping on his sword. This man after God's own heart, a man who loves God, worships God, is devoted to God, acts, writes about him and says, this is a man who served the purposes of God for his generation. And then he's losing his rag over a fool and his foolish words. The question what I want to ask is, how does this happen? How does this happen in your life? How is it you handle some mammoth things in your life and you seem to coast through, you navigate it, they're, they're mammoth, but then all it takes is a navel in your world to say something really petty and you're strapping on your sword. How, how is that? I mean, I'm not asking you, I'm, I'm asking me. I mean, why do we allow that? How come it affects us more? Big rocks in your life and you navigate them with nerves of steel and faith for the fight, and then someone who talks like a fool, like in a playground at primary school, and you're really mad. I'm not having, I'm not having that. 
Well, the more I look at the text, I, I think, I'm not saying I do know, but I think I know what it was. Because when you look at the words that Nabal the fool used, they were all attacking David's personal values. You know, when someone, I, I said earlier in the early service that I, I'm not like big on football uh, and don't stone me. I like it, but I'm not big on it. And if you said, I, oh, you're an idiot, you don't like football, I'd be like, whatever. <laughs> and people can say anything to you and it's like, yeah. But when someone speaks about your personal values, they speak about your family, you're strapping on your sword. Is that right? We strap on our sword because they've touched a button, they've pushed a button. And I just want to say that in all our lives, there are nables. There are fools who push the right buttons in your life because they want a reaction from you. When you look at this, you realize that David was a man of honor. And Nabal attacked David in every area of honor. He was sarcastic. Who's, who's David? The son of Jesse. Is it Jesse, his father? No, yeah, don't, talk, don't touch my family. Don't touch my family. Saul, you can chase me to kill me. Hey, but don't touch my family. I'm getting my sword on. David was a man who empowered others. Why do we know that? Because he took a, a group of discontented soldiers and he empowered them and he trained them for the battlefield. He empowered people. And then he comes along, Nabal, being all cocky, and he, he, did, he belittles his own men's contribution. They deserve that money. But also David was a man of generosity and Nabal. He's just a small-hearted, loaded, small-hearted man. I want to ask you the question, how many times have you allowed the nables in your life to take you to a moment of temporary insanity and you find yourself strapping on your sword? And you just think, I don't recognize myself. Why am I feeling like this? You go to bed thinking at night, you're plotting, you're thinking, well, if they say that, I'm going to say this. <laughs> you're laughing because we do it. And why did I let him say that? Next time I'm going to do this. And we're like, what? Really? Is that what I've come down to? I want to encourage you, church. I want to encourage you as a church. I want to encourage you as families, as parents. Be creators of a totally different environment. You know, when we look at Nabal, his behavior was out of order. But that didn't mean that David had to put him to the slaughter. How many people do you want to verbally slaughter? How many people sometimes you want to physically slaughter, but you wouldn't say to the pastor? You know, one of my values is, is integrity. And then when someone questions your honesty, you feel like strapping on your sword. You know, one of my values is loyalty. And when then someone breaks your confidentiality, it's like, gather the troops, 400 of you, strap on your sword, we're going out to kill them. <laughs> One of my values is unity and community in the house of God. And, and then when someone comes along and they, they start breaking that unity, it's just like, I just want to slaughter you. You know, Proverbs says this, answer a fool according to his folly and he will look wise in his own eyes. You know, when you get even with a fool, you empower them in their foolishness. You know, you can never get even because when you try and get even with a fool in your life, what happens is that you empower them. Not only that, you become like them and you don't even like them. The third and final person I'm going to talk about is Abigail. She is an absolute star. Abigail was the one who rescued a legacy. Verse 14, it says this, Abigail hears of how Nabal responded to David. One of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messages from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. This guy is unhinged. Verse 18, this is what it says. Abigail wasted no time. And then it says, the next word is she quickly. I want just to focus in on that. She quickly. And she didn't sit there and think, 
Okay, Nabal, my husband, has been an idiot. Um, but David is going to come and he's going to slaughter him and slaughter everybody else to do with him. She didn't sit there and I need to pray about this. Not saying you shouldn't, but just saying. She didn't. She got up and it says she quickly, she moved into action immediately to do the right thing and to put the wrong thing right. So it says this, that she gathered 200 loaves of bread, two skins full of wine, five sheep already prepared to cook, bushel roasted grain, which is about eight gallons, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 fig cakes, and she went out to meet David. That is a woman of God's. In fact, what is interesting, she married into the family of Calebites. We don't know if she was a Calebite, but she had the faith of a Calebite. She had the boldness and the stout-heartedness of a Calebite. And then she does this, and I'm going to start wrapping up. I find this so incredible, and I've chewed Alan's ear off all week about this. I think it's one of the best speeches in biblical history. She goes down and she meets him and she's a woman of a wealthy man. And she goes before David and she kneels to her feet, introduces herself. And her introduction is quite interesting. But this is what she does. She doesn't just go and uh, intervene. She steps in and starts to prophesy. She starts to speak what will be. She starts to speak the word of God over him. Number one, she reminds him of his quality. Verse 25, she says this, May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man Nabal. Who happens to be my husband? <laughs> he is just like his name, and his name is a fool, and his folly goes before him. It's like, boom. But what she wanted to do, she didn't really want to put him down. He knew he were down. He was going to kill him. What she was trying to do is, listen, I want to remind you, you're not like him. Right. You're better than him. Because he behaves like that, you don't have to behave like that. Right. Take off your sword. Take off your sword. But then she reminds him of his destiny. Verse 26, says, she says, Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord before he, because he fights the Lord's battles. She reminds him that he's born for kingship. She reminds him of who he is going to be. But also, she says towards the end, which is really important, that you fight the Lord's battles. This ain't that. Right. This is an idiot. This is a fool. Don't give your attention to that. How many of you give so much attention and, and get battle scars from fighting with fools? I want to speak into your life. That's not the Lord's battle. That's their battle. That's how they are. But it's not the Lord's battle and it's not your battle. Keep focused on the right battles to lead you to your destiny. And then she reminds him of his security, even though, 29, verse 29, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, King Saul, the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. She's saying, you know what? You don't have to protect yourself. You don't have to put things right. Leave it with God. Your life is secure. It is tucked away in God's wallet. That's what she's saying. It's tucked away in his wallet. It's in his pocket. Why do you feel you have to go and make things right? Leave it to God as you've left it to God. And then she reminds him of his past victory. This is an incredible speech. Verse 29, but the lives of your enemies, he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. She comes back and she reminds him, do you remember then? Do you remember you and Goliath? Do you remember that victory? Well, yeah, you had a sling. You had some stones. But guess who brought you the victory? Guess who purposed it? Guess who you said would bring the victory for you? God. So this isn't your fight. Put your sword down. Your fight is not in Nabal. Your fight is elsewhere. But then the final thing, she reminds him of his story. And that's what I'm going to do today. Verse 30, she says, When the Lord has done 
When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning himself and has appointed him leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged himself. You know what she's saying? What you do, David, what you do in this moment, because you're mad with a fool, will hit you and shape you for the rest of your life. Bandy can come up. What you do in this moment is going to write your story for you. And I want to ask you today, just two questions as we close. What story do you want written about your life? Well, what kind of story is it? I mean, only you can answer that way. I mean, when you dream and say, in God, I'm going to believe big. What, what story do you want written about your life? Uh, you, do you want the falls in your life to write your narrative? Or do you want God to write your narrative? Uh, do you want the neighbors who say a bit of spin on your life? Do you want that to dictate your steps? Do you want the rude, the obnoxious? Do you want all that kind of personality to write your story? Are you going to let your irritating spouse create your story? And last night, Sai looked through my message. He's not here today. And uh, he looked through it and he wrote there, excuse me. (laughs) I'm still there. I thought, hmm. (laughs) Are you going to allow, like I did, your teacher, your work colleague, your sibling, shape the story of your life? Who's going to shape your story? Are you going to let the fools of the world shape your story, write your story, dictate your reaction or your action? Are you going to let that dysfunctional parent to have the final say on your narrative? Because one day, your action to a fool is going to be the story you tell to your world. And so you've got to ask the question, what story do you want to tell your children? What story do you want to tell your grandkids? What story do you want your grandkids to tell their kids about your life? Oh, they let a fool knock them off track. They they, they let the uh, words of a fool get them so mad, they strapped on the sword, slaughtered him, and that's the story of their life. They quit, they messed up, they gave up. Is that how you're gonna let your story end? Is that how you're gonna let your story go forward? And the other question is, who is the Abigail in your life? Abigails are people who help you navigate fools. That's all, that's all they are. Um, They're the people who come into your world when you're strapping on your sword and you're going to slaughter everyone who, <laughs> who's giving you grief. And they come in and they say, I'm going to remind you of who you are. I'm going to remind you not only who you are, but I'm going to remind you of who your God is. And I'm not just going to remind you of who you are and who your God is, but I'm going to remind you of who your future and what your future holds what your destiny is. They help you to make sense of foolishness. They bring perspective in this manner, a whole picture, the big picture, this is what it is. But right now you're focused on this tiny issue over here that you're not getting paid for for your sheep. You're not getting paid. Just a simple playground action of a fall can knock you into a different direction. Who is your Abigail? You know, David replies when she finishes, verse 32. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. Can you imagine that? Someone in your life that you think, thank God for you. You have made sense of foolishness. And then he says, may you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. What he said meant is, I were going to avenge it myself, but you've helped me to let God avenge it. I could have had bloodshed on my hands, but you have let God deal with it today. Guys, 
Let's stand to our feet as we come to close. I want to ask you, what fool have you given power to over your life? They've tried to write the story of your life. Today is time that we say, I'm not going to be a victim to the neighbors in my world, but I'm going to step up and I'm going to be part of letting God write my story. Stop letting the fools who irritate you and make you fly off the handle have moments of in temporary insanity. Don't let them dictate to you your life or your future. Who's the neighbor in your life that keeps pushing your buttons? I'm, I'm your Abigail today. I look in every one of your eyes and I want to tell you of who you are. You're a people of quality. You're a people of God. You are people who are called and destined by God. I'm your Abigail today. And I want you to step up into that calling and say, you know what? I'm not having my life dictated to by a fool. Whoever it is, whether it's a spouse, a sibling, a child, a grandparent, a parent, whoever, I'm not. Because I know I am. I'm a person of quality in God. And my life is secure in Him. I'm a person of destiny. Amen. I want to pray over you all. I want to prophesy over you all. And so, just as a sign for you before God, just raise your hands towards heaven and just be wide open. Father, if Every soul in this building belongs to you. Every soul has got a destiny in you, a purpose in you. And so, Father, we just ask that you'll help us to be people who are wise with our dealings, that you'll help us to navigate uh, neighbors in our life who will try to knock us off track, belittle us, diminish us. God, that you would elevate the people in this room to be able to be mountain takers and take hold of an inheritance that has been left for us. Father, over every grandparent in this room, every parent, every child, Father, help us to de design a story that is worked through your spirit for your glory. So what is happening in the life of our church? Well, our Zoom prayer meetings have been happening now for a fair few weeks and they are a fantastic opportunity for us as the church to gather together to pray. We know that prayer matters and we know that prayer works. And we also know that your prayers are needed. So if you haven't yet signed up for those meetings on a Thursday night at 8 p.m., please send an email to the prayer email address that's come up below and the team will be in contact. The second thing I wanna tell you about is our Alpha course. We have had a fantastic few weeks where a group have been joining online, going through that course, but we are starting another one in the first week of November. So maybe if you are interested, you've got questions about God, you've got questions about life, or you know someone who has those sort of questions, then please direct them to our Alpha page on our website where they can see all the information and fill out the details so they can be a part of that. Now, this one's a really exciting one because on Sunday next week, the clocks would have gone back. Yes, that means that we get an extra hour in bed. So make sure when you go to bed on Saturday night, you set your clock for church for our Sunday experiences. And on that, make sure that you book in for either 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. as soon as possible. But if you maybe can't be here or know someone who can't be here, then make sure you tell them about our Live at Five, where we go live at five on YouTube, where they can catch some of our Sunday experience on there. For everything else, let's keep on watching.
just seen a fun dancing for ages and we've had our conversation on opposite sides of the pavement shouting at each other and he said oh you're looking really well and I said yeah yeah I'm doing okay with lockdown actually and at the moment I'm feeling pretty good I said what I've been doing though is I've been reading the bible and there's loads of stuff in it you know that there's a lot of hope in there and I think we're going to be all right and there was a bit of an awkward silence like there would have been with me if someone had said that to me a couple of months ago and he said I get you you've become a philosopher and I said no I've become a Christian I just shouted it from the other side of a pavement 